on on the way on the mic's way back up, can I just actually interject that women don't grow out of it, but they seem to grow out of the label. Once you sort of say, oh, but Margaret Atwood writes science fiction, every woman's read that, and every woman identifies with that. Audrey Niffenegg, a time traveler's wife. Once you start to cross the genre boundaries or you get away from the label, all of a sudden it's still grown up. But there is something about it both having the label and being perceived as grown up literature that seems to, to break. No, I just, I just really want to um, say that's an excellent point because from in my region, Caribbean literature, the boundaries of genre are not as rigid so you have a lot of people putting fantastical elements, um, their future apocalyptic elements into their literature, and it's literature, and it's and it's equally it's men, it's women, and, and there's no there's no box, there's nothing there that says oh but you shouldn't be writing that. So you're right, it's not just that. <laughs> it's it's really a case of they have defined it as this, and then also said and we don't want the people who are of this gender to be considered to be writing that. But, you know, they're there, they're writing it. They have the background, they have the knowledge, and even those who claim they don't have the background have the sense to go to those who have the background to help them, <laughs> because that's what I do as well. We, we all have our specialties. I have um, a friend who's a doctor, I have a friend who's a geography teacher, and, and they are my backups for that. That's what I mean when I say you're making stuff up. You don't have to be carrying out the heart surgery yourself, so. Yeah, sorry, if I, could, if I could add to that about feeling that you're kind of a, a well, I mean, I'm not I'm trained in, in a higher degree in terms of science. I did philosophy, so I did a bit of ge geometry, uh, sorry, logic, and I've done geometry. I always felt like I had a kind of a logical mind. Um, and now when I come to do the research, I sometimes, you know, I go, I go quite deep, at, you know, say into GM, GMO. And then I read the opposing arguments because, you know, and so I, I do feel I have come to a conclusion on, on GMO, and, but also revised everything that I thought about nuclear. I went and looked into those arguments as well. And at certain points I felt I'm getting two very, diff you know, I'm just looking at these two opposing arguments. And actually I don't know that I do have the knowledge to, um, to really decide what's, you know, if we need nuclear or not, you know, if we can cope without it. But because I'm writing fiction, I can put those two, you know, opposing views into play, you know, into dynamic play in, 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 in the writing. So, you know, I think that we all should be very interested in science. We're not going to survive in this. We, you know, we really aren't. We're going to take a lot of species down with us. You know, so I think we all really, you know, I think science fiction should be more popular than crime fiction. You know, we, we love crime fiction. We love the idea that it's just, you know, it's just all individual victims and there will be someone noble and, you know, long-suffering who will get there in the end. But we really need to be, you know, thinking collectively here. And we really need to be more informed and we really need to be speaking up. So, you know, I, I think that science fiction as a, yeah, women, men, um, all of us, you know, in the science fiction world could really be boosting, boosting the whole genre um, and getting people excited about it. Thank you. Um, one of the things I was encouraged to get you to think about is, is really where we should go from now. I mean, looking into the future, how can we promote women in science fiction? Should we, for instance, you know, encourage what happened in the 70s, which was uh, the founding of, of the science fiction label of the women's press? I mean, some of my favourite science fiction novels were published by Women's Press. Uh, Russ's Female Man, John Joan Slonsky's The Door Into Ocean. It was a great series while it lasted. Was that the way forward? What, what do you think the way forward is? I think sometimes the problem with having a, a targeted series like that is that, first of all, it, there's a slight ghettoization going on. And second of all, it's easy to get rid of because it's everything in one fell swoop. If you're really going to have um, foundational change, it needs to be in the mainstream. And I also think that right now, if, if you were saying yes to this question back in 2007, was it? 2006? And we're still talking about it. I think we're still at the stage where people are commenting, observing, giving a lot of opinions. But, you know, I'd like to know who's done studies. I'd like to know who's actually come up with solutions. I'd like to know if there are some statistical approaches, some actual, um, you know, kind of, you know, the, the same way that people look at institutions that have had problems in other areas of excluding certain groups. They don't just hope that people will have a change of heart. There's some very targeted things that have to happen. And you have to ask yourself, is this what's required for the publishing industry? I think 
Yes, there's actually been some interesting statistical stuff, um, Strange Horizons and Vida pull together. And what it says to me in terms of what can be done is we know this is not, there's not any one entity, any one group that is at fault. This is a systemic problem when publishing, in booksellers, not the bookseller we're sitting in at the moment, I hasten to add, readers, write, you know, it, it, it is a systemic problem. Um, we've seen some data gathering around the lower percentage of, of reviews um, of women writers and women reviewers and the correlations there and actually they're, they're, you can map this onto not just issues of gender but issues of colour and ethnicity and national origin and so forth. What I tend to think though is that the, the players in this multi-part systemic breakdown that can have the largest impact most quickly tend to be the institutional ones. So they tend to be the booksellers who can at you know at, at, at the HQ level say, right, we want a policy of parity. We we want we could state that as our absolute goal and aim for it and have a measure against which we can be tracked. Publishers, I think, I've I've yet to meet a publisher or an agent who I think is overtly consciously sexist, one of the things they complain about is that <clears throat> they tend to get fewer submissions from women, and that's that's because the submissions don't come in, but it's also not beyond a publisher's gift to flag that up and say, hey, we notice we're not getting an equal number of submissions from women, and what's up with that? Aren't you out there writing? Why aren't you sending it to us? And most importantly, I suspect all of us here who've had this problem with reviews and discoverability would, would talk about the degree of exposure of our books, particularly in the, in the mainstream medias, when we are looking to be talked about and to be reviewed. And that's not, a, a, that's not a request for good reviews, that's just a request to be reviewed. Um, and again, at, at that level of, of large media, large booksellers, large publishing organizations, if they set themselves a goal of parity and they strive to achieve it, that's how you overcome inequities in every other sphere of human endeavor that I can think of. It, it takes that it takes the institutional change because that has a much larger impact than trying to get lots of individual readers to examine their individual reading habits. I guess I'll just um, rather than repeat what things that people have said, maybe just add, you know, what we all can do, um, social media. It seems that social media campaigns really do make a difference, you know. Um, I don't know really what would have been happening with the, the girls in Nigeria without without Twitter and social media. I'm, I'm certainly not trying to compare our fate to theirs. But, um, you know, I think, um, you know, we can all, I, I will name them Waterstones, you know, just tweet Waterstones. What, they, what are they doing with this? Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you to go to Waterstones and buy a women's science fiction book, certainly not, but tweet them, you know, tell them that you, maybe you won't buy from them until they change that. Um, Ask in your local bookshops. Um, I mean, it's great that you're all here. They're obviously, you know, this is a sellout event, really. So, you know, there obviously is interest. Um, so maybe we just realise that we just need to hype it up a bit. Um, you know, that's part, partly what we can all individually do. I personally um, don't think the answer is a press that only publishes women. I want to be an author recognised for what I write, not sort of labelled as female and and published with the female press it, it is as people said the ghetto approach and but more than that I don't think it's the solution because from my viewpoint from what I've seen personally and obviously this is only my own experience the problem is not with the agents the problem is not with the publishers I submitted Earth Girl to an agent he signed to represent me three days later. I had publication offers for Earth Girl from HarperCollins and from Gallants. Getting published wasn't really the problem. The difficulties actually hit a bit later on. And it's not, it's not a big wall in one specific area. It's not um, specific bad dudes sort of blocking things. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, okay, there are sort of a few guys out there who have a, a thing against um, women authors and don't think they, that really <coughs> women should learn to read, let alone be in the science fiction writers of America. But we are there, and we are actually all not all going to leave to please them. So, But, you know, these people are matched by guys who actually support women and champion them, and that, that's great as well. But I, I personally think it's, it's a lot of tiny things. It's a whole series of people think science fiction author and they're picturing white male. It's all the small things. It's you get reviewed, but not quite as often. You get mentioned, but not quite as often. You don't get listed on the list of names on the poster as often. And all these not as oftens add up. So the whole accumulated effect of the not as oftens is the problem. Because, you know, the publishing industry, well, it's, it's always hard days for the publishing industry. Uh, but, but yeah, it's, it's hard days for the publishing industry. A new author needs to get sales, need to get recognition, and they've only got a certain amount of time to do it. And all the little things make it a little bit harder. So I, th I think we're, we're sort of in the situation of trying to overcome um, this sort of expectation that science fiction is written by men. It's a sort of ingrained thing. It's obviously not true. We do exist. Um, but there's this assumption it just makes you less likely to get all these factors that get you noticed and if people don't know you exist if people don't know your book exists it won't get bought and then so the problem is that you have female science fiction writers but they find it harder to stay around because it's harder to get the next deal and the situation reminds me of driving along and seeing a sign at a roundabout that says think bike because people there are accidents because people assume people will be coming along in cars not on motorbikes and it's just the same in science fiction people think it's a science fiction writer it will be male and it, they, they women exist so maybe we sort of want little signs around saying think women sf writer <laughs> We all want the same thing. Um, the name for it in my head is normalisation. We started off with exclusion, where there were very few women SF writers, or they had to pretend to be men, like Alice Sheldon did. We had, I don't want to call it tokenism, the women's presses, because the ground had to be broken. But we've moved on. We want the state, as everyone I think has touched on, we want it to not be relevant where our reproductive organs are. Really, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to bore you with another anecdote. Um, I was at the SFF, SFX Weekender a couple of years ago on a panel with most of the top space opera writers in this country, who were all men. I was the token woman. I wasn't there as the token woman, I thought. The panel was on the relationship between science fiction, the media, and the advances in science. It was a good panel. Three quarters of the way through, the moderator, who is a good personal friend of mine and a writer I admire greatly, turned to me and asked me, so what is your experience of writing in a male-dominated genre? I could repeat it, but it's quite rude, is what I said to him. But, okay, there's no, no people here? He said, what is your experience of writing in a male-dominated genre? I said that I get asked that question far too bloody much, read the fucking books. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Sorry if anyone's offended by swearing. It made me really, well, not... <laughs> It was more frustrated than angry because I thought I shouldn't be asked this. I shouldn't have to have this conversation. Particularly, interestingly, I normally go to literary science fiction conventions and no disrespect to the white middle-aged males in the audience, but that's pretty much all I see when I look out at literary science fiction conventions. SFX Weekender could have been a high street anywhere. Fantastic. So the normalisation had already occurred in these people's minds until it was raised as an issue that perhaps it wasn't. So that's what I want. I want it to be completely irrelevant. Um, we touched on the problems as well. I don't know. Um, I had a rather um, cynical thought, as if, that there's a disconnect. I'm kind of moving on rather than the solution I want to the problems we've got, and I really do want to hear people's solutions to it. Um, 
there's a disconnect and I can't square this circle. We've got critical fans, by which I mean the people in this room that will get off their bottoms on a horrible wet evening and come and listen to us blathering on and that don't look at the gender of the person that wrote the book, they look at the book. You've got fans in inverted commas. Now I may be doing some disrespect here, but there's certainly a perception that a lot of science fiction fans are white males who live with their mum and have bad personal hygiene. <laughs> I don't know that many that are, but there is a perception. There must be some basis there. They probably do look at the gender of the person. They shouldn't, but they do. We can't stop them. There's the general public who, frankly, no disrespect again, are a bunch of sheep. And they like boxes, and the box says science fiction equal male. Ah, good, that's nice and easy, got that sorted. That's bad enough. Of course, none of that matters to us at one level because we're all in the business of writing. So what we need is publishers. And the publishers at the moment are running scared of various changes and crises, recession, ebook, etc. And when you get a business that is running scared, it becomes ultra conservative. It retrenches, it regresses. It takes no chances. Previously, it was, yep, obviously most of the budget will go on that male author, but we've got a bit left for the women. Ah, got less budget. Bye-bye, women. <laughs> As I say, I'm very cynical because I did get, not dropped, but I, um, my contract was not renewed after five books. And the sales weren't that good, but could that have been maybe because they weren't that well promoted? No, there's nobody from Gallants here, I can say that. Okay. <laughs> There are, there are other really good write, women writers who, as, I, as far as I know, have been dropped as well. Trisha Sullivan, uh, uh, Justina Robson. Uh, oh, she's back. Good. She's, if anyone anyway, haven't read Justina Robson, she's wonderful. Uh, so is Trisha Sullivan. And so, of course, is everyone sitting beside me. Uh, but, you know, yes, we've got to remember, that there are, well, we've got to remember a number of things. Actually, male science fiction writers are finding it very difficult as well at the moment. You know, there is a problem in in, term, in, in the publishing industry. Um, the other the other groups, there are plenty of other groups, who are finding it very difficult. If you're a, if you happen to be uh, German or Italian or uh, Swedish or whatever, your chances of being translated and published by a science fiction publisher in the English speaking world are absolutely minimal. I mean, there are one or two, uh, but you know they are not not being taken up again. Perhaps because, as Jane said, publishers aren't just willing to take risks. I mean, it's it's notorious that the English uh, publishing industry uh, translates very very few writers. It's not just science fiction writers; they don't translate, but everyone else as well. So there are all sorts of you know other things we might think of. Now, we've got a few minutes. I, I'm going to hand over and ask for questions from the audience in a few minutes. But have we got, have we, Jane was wondering whether we've yet got any positive solutions to this problem. I'm not sure we have. Um, I think part of the solution should be we should pay more attention to some of the statistics that are being put together because it's too easy for the naysayers to dismiss real concerns when they can claim, oh, all you have is anecdote, oh, it's just because you're personally offended. We need statistics to just have um, something solid for to show to people and say, look, this is what's happening and it shouldn't be happening. So I think that's that's a sort of a good start and quite a lot of things can then springboard from that. I'll just say, for those who don't know, the, the online journal Strange Horizons has published statistics over the last two or three years. And it is very clear, for instance, that uh, reviewing is very dominated by men um, and that uh, it, it's much more difficult for women to, to get reviewed as well. There are statistics there. Then I want those statistics to be disseminated more widely. I think, I think you've just hit on it. Public embarrassment is an incredibly powerful tool and social media, which, which Naomi's touched on, is one of the greatest disseminators of that. And the fact that the statistics exist and are being played around, the fact that the poster and various other inequities have, you know, we've got we've got the means of of sort of doing naming and shaming, which is not a concept I'm always in favour of, but but we're seeing how it impacts in this field at this point. It doesn't seem to have impacted much on mainstream media reviewers, I have to say, but possibly because they've not been talked about quite as much as they, they should be. And I think we've got a kind of a 
concatenation of, of, of ghettos here, genre fiction tends to be ghettoized within genre fiction, works in translation, woman writers, writers of color, and so on, all fall into an increasing sort of filter of, of, of ghettos, each of which gets less and less attention. But the ability to draw attention to the problem and to demonstrate that a market exists so that there is essentially money to be made if one simply can tap in, you know, is willing to tap into the market. And that there is a market to be lost if people perceive that they are supporting something with which they fundamentally do not believe. It's an in incredibly powerful incentive, I think, to, to get change, especially at that institutional level I was talking about. <laughs> I should have added that statistics, it's important to have more than more than one source. You need to broaden your range of sources. You need to look at um, researching different markets, different countries, because you want to compare and contrast. So you don't even want a situation where you do have one main person who's done it because then you can always say, oh, they have this particular bias. You need to have um, sort of many different sources so that you can d just filter out, um, dilute that effect. I just wanted to give a, a, a you know a more a more appropriate example of um, social media in this working in this case, which is the Clark Awards, which I guess last year was or, or male, weren't they? And then there was and quite quite a, a huge Twitter storm. And then this year they made a you know they made a very strong point. They published uh, you know the, their long lists, you know the, the, the books that had been submitted um, by women and by men. And then there was a more balanced uh, sh short list, and then a woman won it. So. You know, I'm, for God's sake, we hope she's not going to go down as, you know, well, she won it because she's a woman, like, um, you, you know, but it's a start, isn't it? It's a start of, um, of, their, of their awareness um, and their, their awareness that people are watching. Um, and now, now now, the talk is, well, when, when maybe eco-SF, why is it, you know, when, when will there be an eco-SF winner of the clock award? But... Yes, I think um, the more people talk about writers who aren't necessarily white and aren't necessarily male, um, the better. And it's something that unfortunately we may have to keep talking about for quite some time. It was starting well before 2007, wasn't it, Jane? Um, we keep talking about it, and the fact uh, people talk about it, it's gradually, hopefully, might impinge on the people who, without thinking of it, automatically come up with a list. And because they're, they're thinking of white males, they come up with a list that's all white males. And maybe if they then look at their list and think, oh, um, maybe there is somebody I haven't been thinking of. Or maybe we just have to wait for one of us to become really, really successful so that there is a face of a woman as a really, really well-known science fiction writer in this country and change perceptions that way. So I guess, um, can one of you uh, <laughs> please <laughs> become hugely best-selling? Of course, if any of us did become really successful, we'd no longer be science fiction writers, we'd become literary, wouldn't we? <laughs> um, I agree with the panellists, yes, um, absolutely, Karen, statistics, because um, I'm fine with anecdotes, but statistics are a much better tool to beat, beat up idiots with. And yes, social media. Um, cynic as I am, I suspect that that message, with, backed up with statistics, is largely reaching my critical fans group, people in this room, that's for people. But the fact that I suspect it shouldn't stop us trying. <laughs>